Welcome everybody to the first week of our course. Now, our course officially, according to the course guide, is going to cover the years between 1890 and 1940. However, in order to set the stage appropriately, we're gonna start a little bit further back, right around the year 1850. So our first unit is going to be called Realism and the Birth of Modernism. Now, before we talk about realism itself, and this is the challenging part about one of these courses where we're starting art history sort of in the middle of a century, is to explain where we are in time so that you can understand the choices artists are making going forward. Sometimes I like to start with this picture, which is by a contemporary artist named Mark Tanzi, and it's called A Short History of Modern Painting. It's a triptych, by the way. A triptych is a little bit of an old fashioned kind of work, but you will see triptychs in this class. They are pictures made of three separate panels that are hinged together or mounted together. And in this one, Tansy is showing from left to right the chronological development and changes that are happening with painting over time. The picture on the left um, really represents what painting was in the time of the Italian Renaissance, for example, the 15th century, when a very famous theoretician named um, Leon Battista Alberti wrote a book called On Painting, where he described painting as being a window. Now think about what that means. What the, the author was saying is that the painting is like looking through a window into a real three-dimensional space that exists beyond it. In the middle picture, we see a man who is banging his head, or pushing his head against a, a stone wall. This is where we are in the middle of the 19th century when we get to sort of the rise of what we consider modern art which we begin with realism. In other words, painting for the artist is no longer a window you see through. Painting instead is a surface. You're gonna see a little bit what that means once we start looking at the first artist we're going to study. On the right, the chicken who's looking at himself in a mirror, that is about postmodernism, really sort of the way art changes in the later part of the 20th century, when art is really about the artist. So this is where we are, painting as a surface. Now, let's talk about when we are. When we talk about realism, it is a style of art that really emerges right around 1848, and its sort of heyday lasts through 1870 at least, though by the 1870s and into the 1880s, it becomes far less relevant. This is a map of Europe in 1848, and I'm not showing this to you because we're studying the map of Europe, but I did want to, first of all, show you where we are um, and to talk about the idea of revolution. Now, let me just make a note. We're going to be looking at a number of different geographic regions in this class. Um, as we get into the 19th century, um, the advent of photography already exists, so artistic ideas spread very quickly, but different cities and different centers at different times are gonna play a more or less important role. Um, in 1848, with the rise of realism, the most important place to discuss is the city of Paris, France. But this map is meant to show you that 1848 was a year of revolution throughout Europe. And there, there was a revolution in France in 1848. Honestly, it had been the third revolution France had experienced in probably about 50 years. But the idea is that the French were discontent um, with the monarchy. At that point, I think only about 30% of the population could vote. And so there was a revolution which led to the overthrow of King Louis Philippe and an establishment of an elected government, um, which was the second republic. So there were strides taken towards the rights of the working class and towards democracy in 1848. And these sort of democratic movements were happening, as I said, throughout Europe at this time.
So that sort of sets the stage where we are in 1848. Um, there's a political movement going on having to do with the lower classes and having to do with, again, this push towards democracy. But now let's talk a little bit about art and the way art was viewed at the time. In Paris in the 18th and 19th century, pretty much the most powerful force was what was called the Academy, which was an art school. It was first founded under Louis XIV in the 17th century, and there were academies, um, often royal academies, scattered throughout Europe. And these were institutions that were very important for directing the way that art developed. They not only taught um, younger students, but they held these public exhibitions called salons. And the idea was that artists would submit their work with the hopes of it being shown at the salon. And when they were shown, prizes were awarded. The academicians, who were the sort of elder statesman artists, would choose the winning works of art among the artwork that was shown. And so what the academies and the salons really did was institutionalize sort of the tradition of art. And as you can see by, by looking at this illustration of a salon, now the salon I'm showing you here is from 1787. So it's quite a little bit before our time. But for example, if I were to fast forward and show you a salon in 1857, so during the period that we're discussing, you could see that it hasn't really changed. The idea of the salon, by the way, hundreds of thousands of people would come to these events. They were big social events. Um, the press would write about works of art that were shown. And there was a very serious hierarchy of how works were shown there. So as you could see, the works were hung up the walls, often quite high. Larger works were exhibited towards the top of the wall and smaller works were exhibited lower down on the wall. But that's not simply what the arrangement was. There was a certain sort of decorum. Certain kinds of work were supposed to be painted larger because they were more important. So the largest, most important works at the Salon were what we called history paintings. They were battle paintings. They were subjects of, of mythological subjects. They were historical subjects, sometimes religious subjects. These could be painted on a large scale because they were important and then they would be hung high on the wall. Lower down on the wall would be things like portraits, for example, very low on the wall would be the least important kinds of objects. These would be things like landscape paintings or still lives um, or what we call genre paintings, which were scenes of everyday life. So there was an order to things. So this is the world in sort of 1848, right about the time that we have um, the revolution, which began with the February Revolution of 1848. And it's right around this time that this work called A Burial at Ornan was painted by the French painter Gustave Courbet. By the way, Gustave Courbet, he trained a little bit for a brief period of time um, uh, with a painter in Paris. Um, he also spent a lot of time studying from the nudes um, at the Free Swiss Academy. Um, and he spent a lot of time at the Louvre Museum in Paris, where he looked at the works of old masters. So you have to understand by the 19th century, we have the institution of museums where artists could go to study and look at works. Um, Courbet paints this work in 1849, so right after the revolution. But he submits it to the Salon several years later. Um, actually, it was called the Universal Exposition. It was another grand public exhibition of this sort in 1855. And in fact, Courbet submitted a large number of works that year. I believe he submitted a dozen or more, but two were rejected. So you would submit works, they might not be seen. Among the works that was rejected was this painting, 
a burial at Ornan, and Corbet was not happy with this turn of events. So what Corbet did was he took his painting um, and he ended up actually removing all of his paintings from the salon that year. He rented a gallery space nearby, um, which he put on a sign out calling it the Pavilion of Realism. And he basically held his own exhibition and, and sold tickets and people would come to see his works. Um, he created a pamphlet which he distributed with his works, um, which included this passage where he was explaining his style of art, which he called realism. He said, to be able to translate the customs, ideas, and appearances of my time as I see them, in a word to create a living art, this has been my aim. The art of painting can consist only in the representation of objects visible and tangible to the painter, who must apply his personal faculties to the ideas and things of the period in which he lives. I hold also that a painting is an essentially concrete art and can consist only of the representation of things both real and existing. An abstract object, invisible or non-existent, does not belong to the domain of painting. Show me an angel and I'll paint one. Now, in order to understand what Courbet did when he pulled his works out and exhibited on the, them on his own, you have to understand what kind of works were popular in the salon in the 19th century. And here you can see the kind of work that was most appreciated at the salon earlier in the 19th century. Jacques-Louis David was the most successful artist at the salon. Um, he won every award, um, even including these awards they would have at the end of the decade for the best paintings. And he painted this um, to celebrate the coronation of the Emperor Napoleon in 1804, which took place in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, um, an event that was attended by the Pope, which was supposed to refer back to the coronation of Emperor Charlemagne a thousand years before. Napoleon actually car carnates himself, he crowns himself emperor, but the painting that David does shows him actually carnating, um, crowning the Empress Josephine. So you can see Napoleon here and Josephine here. Now, um, what makes this the kind of picture the Salon wanted? Well, it was a heroic subject filled with important people. We can see the emperor raised up on this dais in front of the crowd. All of the eyes in the room are focused on the crown. People are idealized and heroic, including Josephine, who was made younger and more beautiful than she was. So. And by the way, when I talk about scale, it's important to mention that these pictures that were at the salon, these big history paintings were big, over 20 feet across in many cases. So when Courbet suggested this picture for this sort of universal exposition, it was rejected because it broke all of the protocol. The people in his picture aren't important and they're not heroic. And yet Courbet dared to paint them on this monumental scale. So let's have a look at Courbet's picture. Courbet's picture was t over 20 feet across. And the reality was it wasn't a traditional history picture, but it was rather what we would call a genre picture. In other words, it was a picture of everyday life, which was the smallest and humblest kind of picture. In fact, the burial at Ornan was supposed to be the funeral of Corbet's grandfather, who had died in 1848. Now, rather than an interesting composition, you know, it's an insistently horizontal composition with the figures haphazardly scattered across the surface. There's no hierarchy suggested. So the priests and the clergy who we see towards the left hand side are not made any more significant than anybody else in the picture. 
Now, normally when there were pictures of funerals, the interest was in the soul and the afterlife and the importance of the person being buried. But Corbet doesn't focus on any of that. We don't even know whose funeral it is when we look at the work. It's an anonymous figure who's being buried and all we can see is the grave digger who kneels down in the foreground before the pit. We know from Corbet that this was actually, as I said, a funeral of his grandfather, who he's, he fudges reality a little bit. His grandfather is actually shown all the way on the right hand side of the picture. And I'm going to circle him for you here. So his grandfather is shown this guy who I'm drawing on right there. Um, and why was this so radical? Well, it was radical because these were unimportant people in an uninteresting composition. And it's almost as if Corbet, without comment, was just documenting a scene from this dreary landscape in this bleak life of everyday people. Now, Corbet actually does, as I say, fudge some things. He shows his grandfather. And as well, there are two figures that we can make out in the foreground who were showed rather prominently. They're not dressed like the other figures in the picture. They're actually dressed in clothes that fit his grandfather's time. See, his grandfather had fought in the revolution in France in 1793, and these men are dressed from that time. These are supposed to be friends of his grandfather. So Corbet, in showing them, is also linking the revolution of 1793 to the revolution that had just occurred in 1848. Now, Corbet began to teach students and he had very specific instructions for people who wanted to be painters. He said, one, do not what I do. Two, do not do what others do. Three, if you were to do what Raphael once did, you would give up your existence, suicide. And finally, four, do what you see and feel. Now, Realism became a very politicized art movement because at the same moment that there was this push for democracy and an interest in the working class, um, and actually by the time Corbet paints this, those rights for the working class were beginning already to erode, the idea of painting unimportant working class people on a heroic scale was radical. And so this is what ushers in this new movement called realism. Now, while Courbet was challenging and confronting the status quo by creating this kind of democracy in art, he was also doing it in terms of style. People were shocked at the way that he sort of aggressively painted the surface so that you could see um, the application of paint. Um, if you look, you'll also notice, and this is a reference back to the Mark Tanzi work I showed when we began, it's, there's also a reference to the fact that painting is a flat surface. Um, if you look, for example, at some of the details, look, for example, at the man with the blue socks in the foreground, and you'll notice there's not a lot of what we call modeling, which is when the artist subtly transitions from light to shade to show a form is three dimensional. Here we see these sort of flattened areas of color, which emphasize that two dimensional wall like treatment of the surface. Similar to the burial at Ornan, and from the very same year is Corbet's The Stonebreakers. Now this is a work, by the way, that no longer exists. Um, this was destroyed in World War II when it was being moved into a place of safety somewhere outside of Dresden uh, when it was struck by a bomb. And so this work is lost to us, but we're left only with the photographs. The work is called The Stonebreakers, and it shows two men of different generations. One, a man maybe in his 60s, one considerably younger. The first wielding a hammer to break up pieces of rock along the side of the road, presumably to be made into gravel for construction. Now, this was the lowest lot that was afforded to 
French peasants, the idea of being a stonebreaker. So these were the poorest of the poor. Now this is not nearly as long as a burial or none, but at eight and a half feet wide, it was a sizable picture with nearly life-size figures in it. And so it still presents again, these very manual labors on this heroic scale. The composition itself is ungainly. The figures are not elegant. There's nothing noteworthy about it. It's as if Courbet was merely noting the actual facts of the event that was witnessed on the side of a road without any sense of artfulness. And again, it has that sense of flattening the surface that we saw in Courbet's Burial at Ornan. So the Stone Breakers is a continuation of that theme, a slightly smaller scale, but still pursuing the same ideas and the same kind of picture that was looked on as revolutionary for its political statement by heroizing the lowest among us. But of all of the subjects Courbet painted, one of his favorites was himself. We actually have a huge number of self-portraits by Courbet, particularly done in his youth. I'm showing a few of them here, though there are quite a few more than this. Many of them are sort of fantastic, almost like he shows himself playing a character. But I will show you two of them in more detail. Now this one is one of the most puzzling um, and sort of unique self-portraits, which was referred to by Courbet at one point as despair, but here it now has the title of the desperate man. Courbet never really commented much on it though, so we don't really know that much of what his intentions might be. Now, it's possible, you know, we know Courbet studied the art of the past, and it's possible he would be looking at perhaps a work like this. This is a self-portrait by another artist who did so many of them, Rembrandt van Rijn, and this is his self-portrait in a cap, where he makes this curious, very expressive face that he turns towards the viewer. And Courbet's picture is similar in that way. Now with Rembrandt, we always have this idea Rembrandt liked to also play characters in his self-portraits, um, although it's possible that Courbet's picture was supposed to be maybe more autobiographical than that. Um, outwardly, people who talked about Courbet referred to him as jovial and generous and having this tremendous lust for life. But during the 1840s, Courbet wrote about his stresses. And in a letter he wrote, behind the laughing mask that you're familiar with, I hide deep down grief, bitterness, and a sorrow that clings to my heart like a vampire. In this picture, it's a very rare, fully frontal self-portrait of Courbet, which means that he really confronts the viewer and he presses into our space um, with a composition that fills up the entire canvas, but it makes it inescapable as if there's nothing else to look at in the picture, which is what makes it so effective. He's using also this super dramatic kind of lighting, which also was very popular in the art of the past called tenebrism, where the artist juxtaposes very dark darks next to bright highlights. And it was also a way of sort of getting an emotional reaction out of the viewer. Now, this is very different from some of his later self-portraits, including this one. Now, this is a good moment to talk about Courbet and his later biography a little bit, because Courbet following 1870 becomes quite political. Um, Courbet wrote a lot, wrote a lot of letters, and they say quite a bit about himself. And at one point he writes, they call me the socialist painter. I accept that title with pleasure. I am not only a socialist, but a Democrat and a Republican as well. In a word, a partisan of all the revolution and above all a realist. For realist means a sincere lover of the honest truth. So 1870 was a very, and 1871, were very sort of dramatic political periods. So in 1870, um, Napoleon III's government, which was the Second Empire, collapsed. 
and a republic was proclaimed. Corbet at that point was elected the head of a commission of artists who were supposed to see to the preservation of um, art and monuments in the city. Now, things get a little bit more complicated. By the way, during that period in 1870, when he was supposed to be overseeing the arts, um, he was involved in a plan to remove um, the Vendôme Column, which was a monument to the old Napoleonic regime, which was a very controversial thing. But then in 1871, there was another revolution, yet another revolution in France. Um, and there was an insurrection in Paris against the French government. Um, the overall French government, which was represented by the National Assembly in Versailles, was a bit conservative, and there was a fear on the part of the Republicans that the monarchy would be reinstated. And so for a period of time between February and I believe May, the um, Commune of Paris was created. They basically rebelled against the French government. And Corbet was very much a part of this government, and he was the head of like the arts commission for this government as well. However, this very brief governmental experiment in Paris ended with what was called Bloody Week, when the troops from Versailles broke into Paris. Um, they ended up slaughtering tens of thousands of people. It was referred to as a massacre. And Corbet went through a very difficult time as he saw um, a lot of his compatriots, first of all, he went into hiding before he was captured, and then eventually he saw many of his compatriots tried and executed. He, however, through good legal representation, was simply sentenced to six months in prison, and he had to pay um, 500 francs for the destruction of the Vendôme column. Now, when he was in prison, eventually he was allowed to paint after a period of time. And um, he was put not into a prison for political prisoners, but into the ordinary prison where he said he was surrounded by thieves. But he was, despite his difficult circumstances, allowed to paint. And so he did a very rare, late self-portrait, which is what you see here. It's probably still idealized. There is this sense of maybe vanity on the part of Corbet because accounts of him at the time he was in prison say that he had um, gone completely gray and was unrecognizable. And here we see him still retaining a bit of his youthful vigor. Um, we see him well dressed, but we can make out the bars on the the window beside him, which give us a glimpse to the outside. And he himself seems to be sort of looking out of the frame, so out of this imprisoned and confined space as well. Um, we see him with the sort of red kerchief around his neck, which may in fact be a political symbol. You know, so this is it, this is interesting because, you know, so many of his early portraits, like the desperate man, have this air of fantasy to it, like he's playing a character. And here we actually see him confronting this very bleak reality that he was facing. Um, he died not that long at the age of 57 after um, he was released from prison, and he actually had to make payments on the destruction of the Vendôme Column for the rest of his career. And now we can look a little bit at another painter, uh, Jean-Francois Millet, who was a contemporary of Courbet's, uh, born about five years before he was. Um, he was an artist who we associate with what was called the Barbizon School of Painters. They were French painters who settled near the village of Barbizon, which is by the forest of Fontainebleau. Um, and most of them spent their time painting the landscape, particularly the forest. Um, instead, Millet focused on the figure, which, and especially the rural figure, which really seems to have been part of his upbringing. He was born from prosperous Norman peasants, um, but he identified himself with the country poor. Now, like Corbet, after the revolution of 1848, he really starts to paint in this realist manner, focusing for him particularly on the rural poor. Um, but unlike Corbet, Millet never really tells us much about his political beliefs, so he was far less political. Um, although people have described him as being pessimistic, so this sort of um, 
very serious take on like the poorest of the poor um, still would have been an affront to the more sort of optimistic bourgeoisie class in Paris. So his work was viewed politically, even if he was less overtly political. Now, the first work that I want to show you is um, The Sower, which Millet actually exhibited at the Salon of 1850 to 51. So it was actually exhibited in the same Salon as Courbet's Stonebreakers. So you could see that these two works together would have had a very sort of serious um, impact. This is a significantly smaller work. Um, and it did attract a lot of attention. Quite a few critics at the Salon mentioned this work. And he had a mix of reviews, which depended very much on the political affiliation of the newspaper in which the review ran. So some of them were favorable, some attacked it. And when they did attack it, it was sometimes attacked for its style and its handling of the paint. You could see that the surface is really rough. And so someone described his painting as as um, Malay's trowel scrapings. So like, you know, trowel is that sort of um, metal tool you can use to apply paint thickly. And one critic said that the figure seemed to be painted with the earth that he sows. Now, the subject of a sower is not an uncommon subject. Um, in fact, harvesters and sowers were popular historical images. I'm actually putting up on the left hand side um, a late medieval early Renaissance illuminated manuscript called the Tre Riche Urs, um, which shows it's a, it's a manuscript that had at the beginning of it a calendar cycle. And calendar cycles were often illustrated with what were called the labors of the months, which were it's a medieval theme. I mean, labors of the months are themes that you sometimes see on like Gothic cathedrals. But what it basically did is it showed what people did during each month. And labors of the months were shown, they show the, the poor because the poor were part of the landscape and part of the natural world and their activities changed according to the seasons. So this is a calendar cycle showing the subject of October, which was the time for the planting of like winter wheat. So we see in the Limborg brothers depiction, you see somebody preparing the fields while the sower in the blue carries his seed around his neck in a bundle and you could see him throwing the seed. And so it's a very similar kind of picture that we see painted by Millet, although some people don't think necessarily that this was based on this earlier work, despite their sort of similar outfit, but think rather that he's thinking back on his memory of his childhood. So very often uh, Millet didn't work from figures, he worked completely from memory and his recollections. So we see the sower sort of striding in this diagonal way down this hill in a picture. He's got the seeds tied around him. Um, he's got um, hay wrapped around his legs for warmth. So once again, this is associated with the fall season um, when the figure is booty planting winter wheat. We can see um, the the oxen in the back right hand corner with the plow so that you could see the field is being prepared and on the left hand side faintly you could see crows circling behind as the the field is prepared and the seed is thrown this became one of the most um, reproduced images of its century other artists are going to comment it on as well particularly vincent van gogh and maybe we'll look at that when we get to van gogh um, the figure was seen as sort of simple and eloquent, and it became sort of this symbol of the creative man. He's a little bit different than Courbet because um, he always has this slightly romanticized nature of the peasant um, where you can really see the dignity that was associated, the sort of heroic nature of rural labor. Um, now, one of the reasons that we feel this way when we look at this figure, this figure looks like monumental and powerful, is that Millet elongates the figure. So traditionally with proportions, um, a body has a head that's about one seventh, between one seventh and one eighth 
um, the length of the body. And here, this, this head is one ninth of the body. So the, the body is made massive. And the artist has done several things to make the figure even more heroic. For example, choosing a very low vantage point. When we look at the picture, like if you imagine your eye level, we're looking up at the figure of the sower. Right, which makes him more massive. And Millet sets the sower apart from the landscape through the use of the red and the blue on the figure. But you can imagine this kind of heroic treatment where he looks like a noble worker um, would have been seen in the same way Courbet's figures were as a threat to sort of Parisian bourgeoisie right around um, 1850. Now, um, it's you know, just very interesting that this figure was actually seen by um, Walt Whitman, the great American poet. Um, this picture was owned by a, um, a Bostonian businessman who was a huge collector of Malay's art, whose name was Quincy Adam Shaw. That's why all these works are now, a lot of Malay's works are now in Boston, because Shaw owned them and he gave them to the museum in Boston um, after his death. Um, and Whitman went to go see this in Shaw's house, and he wrote in his diary that he stood before the picture for two hours. And then later, when he referred to his famous collection of poems, The Leaves of Grass, which maybe some of you have read in English class at some point, Whitman said, the leaves are really only Malay in another form. They are the Malay that Walt Whitman succeeded in putting into words. Now, what's become another one of Malay's famous compositions and one that he worked on a number for a number of years, he worked on this image um, for seven years, making different drawings and painted versions, is his famous painting called The Gleaners, which he exhibited at the Salon in 1857, once again to very mixed reviews. Um, the subject is similar because it's an image of the, the rural poor, um, though treated in a little bit differently. What gleaners were, were they were basically indigent people who were allowed to follow um, the, the harvesters through the field. So after all of the wheat is harvested, they were allowed to come and pick up the small bits of grain that had survived the harvest and had been left behind for their survival. So these were supposed to be the poorest of the poor. This is an image of abject poverty. Um, and it was, you know, the lowest of all of the peasant class. So in that way, it has quite a bit in common with Corbet and the Stonebreakers. It's a little bit different in some ways than the other picture. Um, and this is when you're going to start to see that point of view has a lot to do with how we read a picture. Now, okay, on the one hand, these figures, like the sower, are set apart from the landscape. You could see the landscape is painted in less saturated colors. The landscape sort of fades into the distance, which is a technique that we call atmospheric perspective, right, where the, the artist will um, diminish the saturation of the colors and makes forms less distinct. So the women in the foreground are painted quite a bit differently than what we see in the back. Now, by the way, what we see in the back is all of this wheat loaded up onto a cart. So you can see the abundance of the harvest, which is meant to stand in contract, contrast to the complete impoverishment of the women in the foreground. Um, but unlike the sower who we look up at, who's framed by the sky, these women are bent over and heavily weighted down. You know, they're not in dynamic movement like the sower. They're heavy, almost stone-like, sculpturesque figures um, in these back-breaking poses. They're made anonymous. You know, we don't really see their faces, and in fact, two of the women are in the exact same pose and they are intimately associated with the earth. Um, you know, you notice that two of the figures are bent. The one who looks like she's, you know, suffering from her back and starting to straighten is actually also wearing this yellow cap. They have three different color caps on. That yellow cap, which is the same color as the ground and the wheat and ties her to the earth. 
And unlike the sower who breaks the horizon line, so we look up at him, she's got her head exactly at the horizon line, which sort of forces her down. So there is this sense of symbolic gravity as well as physical gravity. Yet, you know, there always is this sense of dignity that Millet gives to his figures. Again, um, we are in the space with them, you know, which makes their work and their poverty the real subject of the image. Now, as I said, many of the critics, for the very same reasons we talked about with Courbet, um, reacted negatively to the work, but not one. One wrote um, a very interesting review, um, which I will read to you because it's sort of wonderful and it sums up what we've been talking about with realism. The review said, religious painting and historical or heroic painting have gradually become weakened. In keeping, in keeping with the weakening of theocracy and monarchy, the social institutions to which they refer. Their elimination, nearly complete today, brings on the absolute domination of genre painting, a landscape and of portraiture, which spring from individualism. In art as in society, man is becoming more and more man. The modern artist has become convinced that a beggar lit by a ray of sun is in a truer condition of beauty than a king on his throne, that a team going out to plow under the clear and cold morning sky is, as a religious ceremony, equal to Jesus preaching on the mountain, that three peasants bent over, gleaning in the harvested field, while on the horizon the master's wagons groan under the weight of the grain, wring the heart more painfully than seeing all the instruments of torture visit upon a martyr. This canvas, which recalls frightful misery, is not, like some paintings of Courbet, a political harangue nor a social thesis. It is a very beautiful and simple work of art, free of all declaiming. often considered as the urban counterpart to an artist like Millet, who focused on the rural peasants, is Honoré Daumier. Um, Daumier is a very interesting artist. He had a political bent like Courbet did and actually was imprisoned early on in his career for making um, a comical illustration critiquing um, King Louis Philippe. Um, he was mostly a printmaker who worked in a popular medium where these prints were reproduced in um, magazines, newspapers. Um, he made nearly 4,000 lithographs during the course of his career before he succumbed to blindness. He didn't begin to paint, I don't think, until he was already in his 50s. And his works were not generally intended to be exhibited at the salon. Instead, he showed them mostly among a close group of his friends and his patrons. This was actually um, a commissioned work. It was part of a three-part series of paintings um, which depicted three separate classes of um, railway travel. So this were in the inside of a rail car, as you can see, and there is a first class carriage and a second class carriage. This one was the third class carriage. Public transport grew tremendously in the 19th century as a result of industrialization, and Daumier was fascinated with it. So he actually began to make studies of figures on railway cars as early as 1839. In this case, he was commissioned by a man who um, had actually made a lot of his money um, on the railway to make these series of pictures, though this one is not finished, so we don't know if he ever gave it to the collector whose name was William Walters. When I say the work is unfinished, um, you could see this is really just underpainting on the surface, and where you see those very distinct black lines on the canvas, which I will show you here, these very distinct black lines. Those lines are where the artist has drawn over his original drawing with the brush. You'll also notice very clearly if you look up here in the window that there's a series of squares 
on the drawing. That means that this drawing, this painting was squared for transfer, um, which was a technique, let's say you made a small drawing on paper, like a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper, and then you wanted to paint it onto a larger canvas, like this one, which is about two by three feet. Um, what you would do is put a grid of squares on your drawing and a grid of larger proportional squares on your canvas. And then you could use the coordinates of the grid as a way to see where you are on the work to transfer manually the work and size it up. So this was never completed and therefore presumably not given to its patron, but there is at least one other painted version of this work that's a little more finished than this one. But this one's at the Met, so I'm showing it to you because you can go see it. So the picture, as I said, was part of a set of pictures showing um, uh, first class carriage, second class carriage, third class carriage. In first class carriage, people have their own cars, whereas third class carriage is marked by this um, uncomfortable closeness and proximity with the figures stuffed together on these wooden benches. Now we're placed in the foreground, really looking at eye level with the four figures on the front bench. This he has a lot in common with Malay. Think about the gleaners and the way that the figures are on our eye level. And in fact, um, many critics have recognized that these figures look very much related to Malay's figures, so much so that sometimes the figures on the front bench are read as peasants rather than as urban figures. Um, critics have not entirely understood the meaning of the work, but a couple things are apparent. There seems to be a family group in the foreground, and behind we see figures who appear to be somewhat better dressed than the group in the foreground. We have men in top hats, one man with a bowler, and the women have scarves on their head. So it's the poorest figures who occupy our space, almost as if we're occupying a bench opposite them. So they might be a family, in which case we can read the work generally, generationally from the grandmother to the mother to the children. Um, there also have been interpretations of the work that instead have read this um, about labor of the rural poor, kind of like what Malay did, by suggesting that the woman on the left was a wet nurse. So wet nurses were very popular in Paris at the time. About half of the children that were born um, used wet nurses, which basically meant that their parents um, would contract through a government agency with a rural woman outside of Paris who had either recently weaned a child or had lost her own child. Um, and then urban people would give their babies to these rural poor women for up to a year. When the women traveled into Paris to collect their charge, they traveled with um, another person who acted as sort of like their guide. And this person was in charge of making arrangements, picking up payments. And so one interpretation of the picture reads the picture that way with the woman in the middle um, bringing this wet nurse um, to collect a baby and maybe the sleeping boy in the foreground being another child of the woman who has no one to watch him while his mother made this five hour trip in and out of Paris. But it is in this realist spirit, this sort of snapshot of everyday life. There's a certain nobility to the figures, but it's also painted with sort of a real factual air to it as just these anonymous figures in an unposed manner. I do say the word snapshot because it's important to realize that photography had been around since the 1830s um, and artists were increasingly using it in their own works and you almost get a sense of that in Daumier. Now we're going to look at one of the most important and influential realist painters, which was Edward Manet. Manet will also be important as we go forward because he transitions towards Impressionism as well. He was a little bit younger than the other artists that we've looked at. He was born in the 1830 instead of the 18-teens. 
Um, he was a trained artist. He spent six years training in an artist studio, but he also really, really shows how much time he spent in the Louvre Museum in Paris studying after the works of old masters. And it's their works that really become instrumental in his painting and which offer us a different kind of look at realism than what we've seen so far. So we're beginning with this work, which is his Déjeuner sur l'herbe, or The Luncheon on the Grass, <clears throat> of 1863. Now, the picture, though we have um, a nude woman in it, does not seem terribly shocking, probably to our modern eyes. I want to start by saying that when this picture was exhibited in public, women fainted in front of it out of shock. Newspapers couldn't stop writing about it. They were horrified. And so we have to figure out why that is. Now, something very interesting happens in 1863. Manet submitted this work to the salon. Um, you know, he intended this to be, you could see it was a pretty large scale work. Um, he intended this to be exhibited at the salon, but it was rejected in 1863. But in 1863, so many works were rejected for the Salon that the government of Napoleon III actually sponsored another second Salon, a second exhibition that was specifically for the rejected works. So for example, about 5,000 works were submitted for exhibition at the Salon and 2,783 were rejected, including this one. So, you know, he's not alone, but he, they held what was called the Salon de Refusé, which was a salon for the refused or the rejected works. And this was seen there where it was exhibited under the title, The Bath. Now, in order to understand why this picture would have shocked people, I suppose we should look at it in terms of its context of history because Manet seems to have gotten the idea for this picture by looking at paintings hanging on the wall of the Louvre. Specifically, he was looking at this Renaissance painting. This is a painting which is by Titian or Giorgione. One of, it's one of these funny situations where um, Giorgione dies in 1510, and we do not know <clears throat> if this is a work of Giorgione or of his young pupil working in his manner, which was Titian. Um, I always think it's Giorgione. It doesn't matter to you. But in any case, this is a work which we call the Pastoral Concert or the Allegory on the Invention of Pastoral Poetry. Um, so this is a work that at the time was centuries old. And Mana used this as his inspiration. Okay, it's not, a, it's not a copy of this work, but you could see why he was inspired by it. Both of the works um, feature landscape scenes. So there's figures set into the landscape, but the landscape pays a really prominent role with two clothed men and two nude or nearly nude women. Now, Titian's picture is pretty interesting because in the Renaissance, you know, there was what you can consider safe nudity and not safe nudity. So like in the Renaissance, it wasn't really appropriate to paint an everyday contemporary woman nude, but you could paint a goddess nude, right? Goddesses, classical muses, they could be nude. So what Titian's picture was about was this picture was supposed to be about inspiration. So the muses, which were these goddesses um, that, are, that are meant to inspire people. So here you see that there's two men seated, one playing a lute who's finely dressed, another one who's a shepherd, and the women aren't really there. They are inspiration. So one of them sits down as if she's about to join the group playing her own instrument, but the men don't see her or acknowledge her, while the other one draws water from a well, like a well of inspiration. So this was the the source material for Manet in this picture with the two clothed men and the two nude or nearly nude women. You can see there's a nude woman in the foreground. She's just got fabric draped around her leg, which is something that Titian also does. 
And then the woman in the back is dressed a little bit more completely. She's the figure who's taking a bath, which is how this picture was originally named. You'll notice also that Mane um, takes the proportions of the picture from Titian. So even though Mane's picture is quite a bit larger, the proportions, the, the ratio of height to width comes from the picture that he saw in the museum. Oh, he also cites another work, which is sort of interesting, which was this work, also from the Renaissance. This is an engraving by a guy named Marc Antonio Ramundi, who was making a copy of a painting by Raphael. And what you'll notice of this work, the painting by Raphael, by the way, is lost. We don't have it anymore. But you'll notice that this group in the foreground, um, or over on the right hand side, which is comprised of three figures sort of intertwined and seated, is the exact model for the pose of the three figures in the foreground. So none of this seems terribly shocking then. This is all based in tradition. You could see that Raphael's figures were all nude because they were classical figures. And yet, Manet's picture shocked and horrified everybody who came to see it at the Salon de Refusé. It was one of the most scandalous paintings there. Um, just so you can see the kind of criticism levied at it, this was one of the reviews. It said, a commonplace woman of the demi-monde, as naked as can be, shamelessly lulls between two dandies dressed to the teeth. These latter look like schoolboys on a holiday, perpetrating an outrage to play the man. This is a young man's practical joke, a shameful open sore. I mean, that is pretty dramatic. And so the question is why? Can't these women simply be muses like they were in Titian's picture, in which case they wouldn't be scandalous at all? But when we look at the picture more closely, we realize the answer to that is no. Why? Well, this still life in the foreground, this set of objects, you can see these figures look like they're on a picnic. And so we see a basket tipped over with fruit and a roll. But over here, we see the women's clothing. And as soon as we see their clothing, it removes them from this semi-mythological realm and it puts them in the here and now. Those are contemporary fashionable clothing. And it turns them from being the nude muses of of Titian to being naked prostitutes. And this was the shock. Um, these are real people, by the way, that Manet used for his work. Um, the man with the cane was Manet's brother. The man in the center was a sculptor who he was friends with. And the woman on the left was a model named Victorine who Manet used quite frequently. So, this is realism in a very different way. It was painting like we saw in um, Millet or in Daumier, the sort of working, working, literally a working class woman, um, and painting them in a heroic scale. So just like Courbet did at the Salon when we first talked about the burial of Orna, burial or none, where that picture was a genre subject, but he painted it large and heroic. Here, Manet did the same thing. Now, it's not nearly as large. This is only about eight and a half feet across. But just so you know, by the time we're talking about the 1860s, artists are working from paint from tubes, and they've got pre-stretched canvases, which means when an artist would go to buy his materials, he would choose a numbered canvas. They had a number 10 canvas, and it went up to a number 120. Anything larger than the most, than the, than the, mo than the readily available pre-stretched canvases, anything larger than the largest one of those would announce itself as important. And that's what Manet does here. It's larger than the largest available pre-stretched canvas, which means that Manet was playing the same game as Courbet by taking this scene of everyday life and a sordid kind of everyday life and blowing it up to this enormous scale. So how else did it shock? Well, it shocked by its subject, right, as we said. And, and this is made even more shocking 
by the glance, by the gaze of the woman in the foreground. You know, the female nude is the oldest subject in the history of art, right? When, as, you know, in, in back in in Neolithic, Paleolithic times, when men had rocks or caves, they painted nude women on them. Why? Because nude women, you know, are they were important for the survival of the species, right? Critical. However, over time, nude women always remained the most popular subject for art, and the presumed viewer is the male. So usually it's a nude female body being looked at by a male spectator. And what was so shocking about this picture was the very direct, confrontational way she stared back, sort of implicating the viewer in the scene. Uh, and not with the downcast eyes of a sort of seductive Venus, but with this straightforward, matter-of-fact glance. It was also shocking to people because of the style in which Monet painted, which we talked a, lot, a little bit about for Courbet and for Millet. And you could see it here as well. Um, they accused him of troweling. That's we sort of heard that term about the painter's trowel when we looked at Ma uh, Millet, like he was applying these heavy swaths of paint. And in a lot of ways, it looks shockingly unfinished to the modern eye. Like, for example, we see this reclining figure and we read his pants as having these creases in it. But when we look at that, we could just see those are two quick slashes of gray paint. Um, we don't see any modeling on the body. And once again, normally when you want to make a figure look three-dimensional, which had been the tradition, um, you would see a solid color, the hue of the object, and then light and shade applied to make that thing look volumetric. Here, there's no shadows on her body. It's this bright, blindingly white area of paint with not a lot of detail on it. And even as we look into the background, you'll notice that although we read this as foreground and a middle ground and a background, there's really no transition that makes this background move back in space. Um, that model could be up as much as back, right? So we're reading it because we're conditioned to read pictures a certain way, but this is all very quickly, almost abstractly painted. And that too was shocking for its time. So Monet apparently didn't think he was going to cause this sort of scandal with this work, but he does. Um, but he didn't just do it with this work. But he did it with this one as well, which is his work called Olympia. Um, this is painted near the same time Although he doesn't submit this one to the Salon right away, so the other one was shown at the Salon de Refuse. This one he actually withheld for two years before submitting it to the Salon in 1865. Um, as you might imagine, it has a couple things in common with the other picture we just saw. From its oversized nature, considering its subject, um, from the fact that it was based on an older work of art, and then the fact it even has the same model. Um, this is Victorine, once again, that we can see with her red hair. Um, the painting that the picture of Olympia was based on was another Renaissance painting by Titian, which was called the Venus of Urbino. Right, which was actually not in the Louvre, but it was in Florence, but uh, images of it were widely available by the middle of the 19th century. Um, Titian's picture, the Venus of Urbino, was a pretty interesting picture even in its own day because the title alludes to the goddess, right? the goddess of sort of love and beauty, Venus. And there's a few things in the picture that reference Venus, like the flowers, the roses she holds in her hand, which were associated with Venus. Roses were supposed to be born at the same hour of the as the goddess. And the pearl earrings she wear, because um, Venus was supposed to have been born out of the sea. However, the picture isn't really of a goddess. Titian's picture on the left-hand side shows us this up close of a reclining nude. By the way, the reclining Venus was a tradition that was very, very old. 
but the right hand side of the picture would have given away that this was not a goddess but a contemporary woman and we could see that because there's um, a woman leaning into a chest on the floor picking out clothes and you could see a dress slung over this maid's shoulder so this part of the picture turns the reclining woman from a nude goddess into a naked woman now I said that stuff like that wouldn't have been acceptable well this was a private picture for a private work of art given by the Duke of Urbino to his new young 10 year old bride um, so it's a wedding picture and it was an erotic picture meant for private settings so we could see the dog by her feet which is a symbol of fidelity and the dog is sleeping which means that the Venus who looks out at the picture presumably at her lover which is her husband um, is a faithful sort of welcomed visitor and so the dog shows no alarm and simply sleeps and just as a point here you will notice the erotically placed hand that um, Titian places right on the central axis in the work so this is the picture that um, Manet modeled his picture on so very closely you could see the same colors and arrangements of the cushion and the drapery you could see the same split down the center of the canvas with the background although in Titian's picture we've got closely walled space on the left while we have this deep perspectival background into a palace whereas here um, there is another closely walled in space so the picture is far more claustrophobic and there's not a lot of places for our eyes to go um, the servants in the background have been replaced by a single servant in the foreground who's bringing the woman a, um, a bunch of flowers again presumably from a lover so why so shocking and once again people would have known Titian's picture the picture was reacted to poorly let's say so this was one description uh, it called it a courtesan with dirty hands and wrinkled feet her body has the livid tint of a cadaver displayed in the morgue her outlines are drawn in charcoal and her greenish bloodshot eyes appear to be provoking the public protected all the while by a hideous negress um, is in the language of the time um, the woman in this picture is again a prostitute now how do we know that well the title Olympia which is sort of a clever play on the part of Manet to call her Olympia which on the one hand suggests Mount Olympus which was the home of the gods but here calling her Olympia um, that was a name that was sometimes used by prostitutes and so again that would have brought the picture into this modern realist realm and a lot of the reaction by the way was the same but a lot of the issues that Monet was playing with were the same as well um, people were horrified by the subject that she was a prostitute and they were offended by her body which they saw as being sort of very inelegant sort of a peasant class utilitarian body as opposed to a graceful nude um, you could see that um, there's all sorts of evidence of this sort of sexuality of the scene from uh, the dog who has been replaced with this shrieking black cat and cats were associated with witches and female sexuality and you could see it is not um, comfortable with the visitor which is the viewer which means we're a customer so presumably the flowers being brought by the servant which um, which Olympia more or less ignores come from us and she confronts us with this very very again direct and off-putting gaze the seductive sensual hand of Titian's Venus of Urbino is replaced by this bracing hand against her thigh calling attention to sexuality but not welcoming either so confrontational um, the black servant suggests that she's not a woman of a low social standing um, and yet the presence of the black servant was also probably there to um, 
again, sort of become not just a foil against the very white body of Olympia, but also for sexualized reasons, because black women were seen as sort of exotic, right, which was associated with all sorts of of sexual ideas. And you're going to see this as we look at other images of of sort of the other you know, the non-white European types that were used throughout the 19th century. And Picasso comes back to this as well with African types, and we'll talk about that. So the picture not only shocked because of its subject matter, and again, that direct gaze where the nude woman was looking at the spectator as much as the spectator was looking at the nude woman. Um, so people thought it was indecent. Um, but we also see Manet's now characteristic sort of lack of finish that shocked people as well. So again, we don't see modeling except in a few places like on the hand. But even then, it's done in this very sort of minimalistic way. There's no shadows on her her body at all. And you could see the very sort of quick treatment of the drapery down below. And that's going to take us in the direction of of impressionism in short order. Before we leave French realism, I wanted to stop in and look at one last painter and somebody who is a little bit different than the other artist we look at, um, which is the artist Rosa Bonheur. She was a painter and a sculptor. She spent most of her career focusing on the subject of animals. She herself is a fascinating character. She was a complete nonconformist. Um, her father, now, okay, it was very, very exceptionally rare for women to be trained as artists um, in the 19th century and certainly before that. And usually the only way you had female artists was when they were trained by their painter fathers, which is what she was. So she was um, she was the daughter of a man whose name was Raymond Bonheur, and he was a painter and a teacher and he was a radical socialist and he believed in treating his children male and female equally so he taught his daughter to paint um, she too was politically very far to the left but her art is more conservative so she's actually in a lot of ways a more interesting character than her art um, she sketched in public when she made her works. First of all, I said she spent most of her time painting animals. And so she did unconventional things like um, hung around slaughterhouses where she could study the anatomy of animals. And when she worked on the artwork we're going to look at, which is the horse fair, um, she spent a lot of her time sketching in public, which would have been frowned upon as a woman. And so she did it dressed as a man. And then in fact, she preferred to dress in masculine clothes. And she spent most of her life wearing that way. She actually had to get permission from the police to dress as a man. You know, she preferred to wear trousers and very simple clothes. Um, it was actually an authorization she had to have renewed every six months. And she had to have it like co-signed by a doctor um, who said that it was for health reasons. She wore her hair short, um, she smoked, uh, so she's a really interesting character. And towards the end of her life, when she was quite wealthy, she had a lot of success. Um, she had this chateau and she had all sorts of animals around her. And here you could see a picture of her with her lioness, Fatma. So um, she, unlike the other artists we've been looking at, exhibited um, at the salon and usually met with quite a bit of praise. This is Rosa Bonheur's most famous work, which is called The Horse Fair, and it's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, now, interestingly, like I said, she was politically and in her own life very radical. Her works in a lot of ways were quite conservative. So there's some things about it that really fit in with what we've talking about with the more political aspect of realism, but without the meaning. So in other words, like the other realist painters we were looking at, beginning with Courbet, she's doing something very similar here, which is to say she's painting an everyday subject on a heroic scale. 
So this is a picture, it's about 16 and a half feet across, so it's massive, it like eats up a whole wall at the Metropolitan Museum. And at first glance, it looks like a very traditional subject, it looks like a battle scene. And honestly, to stand in front of this picture, it is, it is actually threatening. You know, you can hear the hoof beats, it is, you can feel the movement and the energy and the wild danger of these horses. In reality, the subject was everyday life. This is a scene, it takes place in Paris, and this is, of course, before the automobile. So um, horses would be shown on display, like you could buy horses. And so you can actually see people here, um, up on this sort of grassy hillside. Um, those are the spectators as the horses are coming down this street. You can see the cobblestones and it's covered with dirt. You can see the animals kicking up dust. This is the exact moment in the road where the, the animals are sort of U-turning. So they're turning violently in space to head back up the boulevard. And Rosa would go to watch the horse fairs twice a week for m more than a year while she was making studies for this work. So in addition to studying animals at zoos and slaughterhouses, she also watched the horse fair itself. Um, she says that she was inspired, though, by really traditional art. For example, there were um, French Romantic painters like Jericho who painted horse scenes. And she says that to her, this was sort of reminiscent of the Parthenon frieze, which is a work from ancient classical Greece on one of um, Greece's most famous temples. Um, she, like about, now where is it not particularly dramatic? It's got a lot more finish, at least in the foreground than we saw in the works of the realist painters, although some details as you get further back in the painting are painted in a style that looks very similar to what Courbet had done with a lot of texture on the surface. Um, and you could see that, you know, there is this not total set, it's not flat the way we'd seen other artists at this time. You can see real modeling and light and shade. So it had a degree of finish that was very different. And of course, it lacked the sort of political meaning that we saw so many of the Impressionists take up. Um, the work was a success when she showed it, um, and eventually it was bought by an English dealer who took it on tour. So it went on a tour of England where it was um, brought to Buckingham Palace, I think, or at least a request was made by Queen Victoria to see the work. And then it went on a several year tour of America, and ultimately it was bought in 1887, so quite a bit later, for a record sum of $53,000 by Cornelius Vanderbilt, who ended up giving it to the Met, where we see it now. Now, this accounts for a lot of Rosa Bonheur's success as an artist. Um, so she had financial success. Um, at a certain point, her style became quite passe. It looked very old-fashioned. I mean, Rosa's working into the 1890s, I believe, and so she does not really have any, like there's no effect on her of Impressionism or post-Impressionism. She lived quite near the Barbizon forest where the Barbizon painters painted and she found them boring. Um, but even once her art became passe, sort of in France, because it wasn't really responding to the more um, contemporary art movements, she had such a big following um, in England and America that she never lacked for work. And, you know, she painted also, you know, I think a picture of Buffalo Bill. So, she, you know, she's sort of this Western theme having to do with animals. Um, yeah, I think that that is what we're going to say. So I just wanted to show you this, like a, a different take on realism. And that is where we're going to leave realism in general. And we will come back um, next week and we'll start talking about Impressionism. And you're going to see just how quickly style begins to change in this class. By the way, for Rosa, I'm going to leave online for you a wonderful short three-minute video where an artist is talking about the work, but it also has some fantastic close-ups that are impossible to replicate on my PowerPoint screen. So make sure you check that out. I'll see you next week.